Welcome to Mayhem, an experience designed specifically to give you chills and have you wanting more by the end. My name is John Andrado, and I will be your host. Today's story is one that has almost been lost to time, but the mention of a specific name can instill fear in those who remember it. Now, for those of you that were born past the 2000s, I'm sure the name Dr. Beckley instills absolutely no fear and has very minimal effect, if any. But for those who were present in the 90s, the very early 2000s and the years before, that name, I'm sure, did something to you. But as we always do, we must set a stage and this stage is built from scratch in 1994. The town is New Fadama, right here in Accra. New Fadama was once a fairly quiet neighborhood which had seen its fair share of changes throughout the years, as did most neighborhoods at the time. From the small houses to the bustling streets on the main road, this community had developed and evolved into a place where families used to feel safe. And amongst its environs was a man who I want to believe was revered respected, saluted, seen for the wonder that he was as a medical practitioner. His name was Dr. Sri Yogi Ram Beckley. It would be because of this man that things would take a very drastic, very shocking and very haunting turn in the days to come. In February 1994, Dr. Beckley's house was raided for the first time and authorities would make a very disturbing discovery. That of bloodstained skulls, very bizarre items which you could describe as cannibalistic, which would eventually hint to something far more sinister being in the works. Eventually rumors would begin to spread like wildfire, as would be the norm for most communities in Ghana that Dr. Ram Beckley was not an ordinary man. He was labeled an occultist, someone who would allegedly kidnap children and offer them as sacrifices to the gods which he worshipped and served. Later, Dr. Beckley would be processed and taken to court where he would face charges of assault and kidnapping, particularly when it came to the case of a class 3 pupil. The attorney general's office at the time would step in and bring a halt to the proceedings by suggesting a discontinuation of the trial, seeing as there was not enough substance to these claims. He would be set free, his life would seemingly return to normal, but that would not be the end. Eight years later, in 2002, Dr. Beckley would resurface in Bowie, and this time, He'd be suspected for kidnapping a 13-year-old girl and her friend. It would be described as a terrifying ordeal, one in which he tied and cuffed one of these girls to a tree and dragged the other one into his home. Be it luck, be it fate, or be it happenstance, a passerby would hear her calls for help and would rush into the house and set her free. As word of this event would get out into the public, fear would begin to spread like wildfire and people started considering taking matters into their own hands. And not too long after this, an angry mob would attempt to torch Dr. Beckley's house, not once, but twice succeeding on the second time. An incident which would leave him homeless as the community was on edge. 
he was said to have disappeared, never to be seen again, until 2005, where his daughter, Miss Olive Beckley, would once again make headlines, this time threatening court action against the government and the Ghana Immigration Service for denying her father a passport. The story would only get stranger from here as till this day, his whereabouts remain a mystery. The very interesting thing about this entire Dr. Beckley saga is I remember the impact it had on the school system primarily and how teachers and parents taught their children self-protection, self-defense in some respect. To provide some realistic context to this from my perspective, I was about five years old when the 2002 event happened and I was just now getting into kindergarten and all of that stuff and I remember my teachers at the time they started teaching us very interesting things you know when a stranger tries to lure you with gifts and sweets don't enter his car if you see gifts or, or sweets on the ground don't pick them up if you see robbers on the ground do not pick them up they would teach us these very interesting things and in almost a fearful sense there would also be this song which they taught us which quite frankly I'm not going to sing because my vocal cords would fail me. But the words of the song are basically this. Osama Bin Laden, Bickley, Bickley. And looking back on it now, I really wonder how Dr. Beckley and Osama Bin Laden are in the same echelon for an entire song to even be made. Growing up as well, the events of this would gradually fade and no one would seem to know where he was there have been a vast number of rumors concerning where he's been now in the course of my digging to bring you this very special episode i have been able to obtain two accounts somewhat similar but also very different in how things played out one of which stems from new fadama and the other from Bowie. These are from people who were present at the time of these events and gave me their first-hand accounts. Now, I want you to consider that some of the things they say might come across as hearsay. A lot of the facts surrounding Dr. Beckley are very speculative. They are alleged. I honestly don't believe anyone knew him But there was a perception that seemingly became reality and that reflects itself in these accounts. And that is not to say that these are people that would outright lie. But these people presented what the perception of this man was at the time. Now the first account is from a woman who lived in Fadama at the time of Dr. Beckley's first raid and arrest in 1994. It is said that he was married to an Indian woman and this woman would constantly help him escape anytime he found himself in the crosshairs of the law. Now, there was a far more damning allegation that was made and it was that his children made his bloodlust or his sacrifices easier to make as they would lure friends or classmates to his home where he would have his way and do whatever he wanted with them. It was also said that his house in Fadama had become a place of worship. But this person who has lived in the area could not confirm these claims that had been made in the past. The second account is the one I find more interesting because it is far more detailed. The person who gave me the second account has lived in Bawi for practically his entire life. 
and in the course of my conversation with this person, this person actually showed me the former Gwawi home of Dr. Ram Beckley. I have seen it with my own eyes and I can give you a very vivid description. So here it is. During Dr. Beckley's stay in the Gbawe community, he was said to have a home that had very high walls, almost 10 feet in height, if not more than that. This wall was constructed of cement and stone. And the rationale was seemingly because this area is a waterlogged area. It's a place that easily floods. Slightest amount of rain, the road goes bad, houses flood. And so because of this high wall, you could not see what was within the house. This person likened his home at the time as being a castle. And that's not to speak to the height of the building itself within the home but it was more to the scale and size of the compound in which he resided this person went ahead to tell me that once you entered dr ram beckley's home you would find the main building you would also see the cars he owned parked in the compound and you would not suspect anything until you started to look around the house and really began to explore where you would find these miniature or small summer huts all over the house, several in number. These summer huts were also likened to that of a fetish priest's home as seen in a lot of these traditional movies and Nollywood movies, if you will. And it was within these summer huts that the members of the angry mob would find bloodstained skulls, full skeletons, and even school uniforms. The interesting thing he made mention of was that school children kept going missing across that period of time. This person provided some more clarity and detail into what happened the night Dr. Beckley's house was torched. This person tells me that allegedly Dr. Beckley had succeeded in luring a young girl and her friend to his home after school one day. And it was once they entered the home where one of the girls was tied to the tree and the other girl was dragged into his home, as I mentioned earlier. It was then that this young girl would scream for help and she would be saved by the passerby I also mentioned. It would turn out that this girl was the daughter of a trotro driver who was operating at the Malam station at the time, which happens to be less than a kilometer from Dr. Beckley's home, narrates this terrifying ordeal she's had, and in a rightful fit of anger and rage, this father approaches the police with all of this information. And it was there that the police moved to his home in an attempt to arrest Dr. Beckley. It was also in this moment that they would find an angry mob who was on the verge of lynching Dr. Beckley. Seeing as the situation was a very tense one, the police would move Dr. Beckley away from the scene and into their custody. And it was in his absence that his house was set on fire. Now, according to him, he never heard much of Dr. Beckley again. The last he heard was he had moved away and gone to live somewhere around Abekan La Paz, where the acts would resurface and then he was never heard from again. Now, earlier I mentioned that I had seen Dr. Beckley's home. And let me give you a very vivid description of what I saw. This home is in an area of New Bawe called J. Ayo. There is even a bus stop to that effect on the main road. So if you know that area quite well, if you are approaching Julikat, it is just before that area. This place has also been called J. Ayo 
because there is a home not too far from Dr. Beckley's former home that has the inscription J. Ayo. Now, the home itself is very difficult to see. You can only see it from a certain angle, really. As weeds and trees, plantain trees, I should say, have grown into this very dense bush that has covered most of the house. I should note that there is somewhat of a wooden barrier that covers part of this bush that has overgrown and covered this home. I have also seen this rather very high wall. If I'm not mistaken, it's at least 12 feet. It's it's a pretty high wall. I could be wrong because I saw it from a distance and it seemed very high. The place also does seem to hold a bit of mystique, probably due to the nature of events that occurred on that specific piece of land. Because every other place surrounding it seems to be developed, except for this spot. And it's been 21 years since that incident. Ever since these events unfolded, Dr. Beckley's whereabouts have been a mystery. No one seems to know, but most people seem to have a theory of some kind. I have read from one newspaper article from back then that Dr. Beckley was said to be journeying from the Volta region to Accra for his court proceedings and appearances. There is one more sighting, which I find to be the most disturbing of the bunch. And it is one that was reported in 2003 in the community of Adreso in Koforidua in the eastern region. The story goes that there was a group of women and they were returning from a funeral in a nearby community to Adreso. And it just so happened that at midnight, they spotted Dr. Beckley carrying what looked to be a miniature coffin through the streets of Adreso. It would be this alleged sighting of him that would spark rumors in the community for about two weeks where these women would plead with their community members and their neighbors to believe them that they had actually seen the man walking the streets of Adreso with a miniature coffin. It doesn't get much scarier than that. The last we heard of him in this regard would be from Olive Beckley in 2005 when she raised the concerns surrounding her father's denial of a passport. It's almost like playing a real life version of Where's Waldo? You know, the guy with the red and white striped sweater with the glasses who you have to find in books. But we do hope and pray that there is never another type like this. Because the mention of his name was truly terrifying for so many children, myself included. I remember seeing one picture of Dr. Beckley and it's not the one that you'd find on the internet now with him being bald. It's not that one. The one picture I remember of him is him with the beard, but him also having very overgrown hair, almost like an afro. This is one of the very few mental images I have of him at the time. I think I saw it in the PMP newspaper at the time. Aside probably the Atai photograph I saw in the Daily Graphic in 2005, this is the other photo I remember so vividly that just, it, it's paralyzing to think about. And it is on that note that we'll end this episode on the man that we've come to know as Dr. Sri Yogi Ram. Beckley. I want to thank every single one of you for listening. Make sure to follow Mayhem wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Wherever you do find your podcasts, we are right there. My producer is Jeffa Makafui. And as always, stay safe, keep your doors locked, and never stop inquiring into the truths of this world. My name is John Andrado, I serve as your host, and this 
is mayhem.